And now look to Mr. Peter Lilly to continue the case for the proposition. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be invited back for what is actually my second speaking engagement in Oxford this week. Uh, but it's a particular pleasure to be invited back to speak in the Oxford Union, which brings back nostalgic memoirs, memories of my own days at uh, another university in the Fens where we had a similar uh, union. <laughs> I was uh, then too nervous and tongue-tied actually to participate, but I did enjoy the debates. And there was one we used to have every year, which I was reminded of, uh, which in those days we had rules, uh, which sort of seemed archaic and uh, antique to you, but uh, the rule was that you weren't allowed to have a member of the opposite sex in your room after 10 o'clock at night. And the debate every year was whether this should be abolished. And one year, the uh, proponent for change said, but what can young people do after 10 o'clock that they can't do before? <laughs> to which the proponent for the status quo, who was a professor of logic, said with commendable logic, nothing, but they can do it again. <laughs> uh, and, So to be invited to do it a second time in the week is pretty good for my age. Um, <laughs> long before I became a member of Parliament, when, as my mother used to put it, I had a proper job, I was uh, a, a development economist working in Africa and Asia on aid and development programmes. As a result of which, uh, uh, to cut a long story short, I'm now, and because of my interest in the subject, I'm now co-chair of an all-party parliamentary group called Trade Out of Poverty, whose name says it all that we believe that the best way for developing countries to leave poverty behind is to trade and grow uh, through uh, trading with the rest of the world. Now, Trade Out of Poverty is currently having an investigation, uh, an inquiry into uh, ways of encouraging more trade within Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world. And I've been struck by how many witnesses, witness after witness, has said Africa cannot develop without power, electric power, cheap, reliable and continuous electric power. And they're surely right. How can industry function with no regular supply of electricity? How can people study if they have no light in the evenings? How can hospitals operate if they have no electricity to keep their refrigerators and operating their drugs uh, to keep them useful? Now, I don't uh, often uh, quote Lenin, but I'm told that one should always appeal to the left-wing element in an Oxford <laughs> university. Um, uh, and Lenin said uh, that to bring about the workers' paradise, to bring an, a, an end to poverty, uh, two things were needed. Soviet power and electric power. And he was half right. Uh, <laughs> it, this debate is ultimately whether or not we're in favour of ending world poverty, poverty as quickly and humanely as possible. Last year, electric power began to flow from the huge Madupi power station in South Africa, the fourth biggest uh, power station in the developed world, developing world. Uh, the South African government believes that that power station is critical to the future industrial development of the country and for the elimination of poverty. But a few years ago, when they applied to the World Bank for a huge loan to finance it, uh, there was a great outcry from the uh, eco-warriors across the globe which persuaded the British government, the American government, and the European governments to oppose any loan to South Africa. Fortunately, they were outvoted by all the developing countries on the World Bank. The loan went ahead, and the power station is now producing electricity. The opposition was, of course, because it was a, a coal-fueled power station. But uh, I'm glad that the rich countries were outvoted by the poor countries, because uh, the reason South Africa and China and India rely on hydrocarbons like coal or gas 
is that they produce electricity at a fraction of the price and far more reliably than wind or solar. In this country, our coal-fired plants produce electricity for 50 pounds a megawatt hour. We have to guarantee a price twice that for windmills uh, onshore and three times offshore. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we need to build an equal capacity of hydrocarbon-fueled stations to operate when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine. And even in sunny countries like Africa, I have news for you, it doesn't, the sun doesn't shine at night and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So if so South Africa had tried to meet its electricity needs entirely from, uh, in, uh, in a moment perhaps, uh, from wind and solar, they would have had to build the equivalent to this huge uh, coal-fired power station uh, ready and available as backup. So the cost would not have been two or three, but four or five times as expensive as it is. Now, the Greens uh, are, and if, if it costs four or five times as much to generate electricity, then they can only afford a quarter or a fifth as much. And so they're going to develop much more slowly, and their people are going to remain in poverty for more years and more generations. And we have to decide which is more important, that they should... Uh, grow out of poverty, or uh, satisfy our environmental beliefs. The Greens argue very patronizingly that uh, we're acting in their interests uh, because they, they suffer, the poor suffer most from climate change and are most vulnerable to droughts, floods, diseases uh, that uh, global warming may exacerbate. That's true. The poor are the most vulnerable to these things. You don't have serious life, loss of life from these things in developed countries, you do in poor countries. They're vulnerable because they're poor. They're poor because they have not yet harnessed energy. If we make energy four or five times as expensive, it will take longer and slower before they can put their vulnerability behind them. So, uh, the other reason people say is that, uh, okay, we accept that they will... Um, uh, need to develop, uh, to use energy if they're to develop, but uh, they uh, must nonetheless uh, be discouraged from doing so because if there's too much uh, CO2 emitted into the atmosphere, the whole world will suffer inconsciously uh, and much more so than the growth they will enjoy. Well, read the Stern report. Read the IPCC report. They predict that if the, the world continues to grow, and it will only grow by using hydrocarbons, the damage that that causes will only reduce the rise in st living standards by about a tenth. Stern says in his most extreme scenario, it will reduce it by a third. But they will still, in a hundred years' time, be two or three times better off than we are now. I submit to you that we should be putting our emphasis on letting the developing world put poverty behind it. Uh, rather than trying to make the next generation a little bit richer than us when they're going to be three times as rich as us anyway.